scripture reading this morning is from Micah chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. Marshal your troops, O city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor gives birth, and the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely, for then his greatness will reach the ends of the earth, and he will be their peace. All right. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Um, I don't know when you consider your best years are. You have a time in your life when you consider those were the really good years of my life, Um, but I think we find in Scripture a constant offer for everyone, for every time, of a better day, and that's what I want to talk to you about, is a better day. Um, I don't know what you think about the days that we live in now. I mean, with everything that's going on in our world, um, I don't know everything that goes on personally with you, but I mean, you have your personal situation, you have your political uh, stuff going on all the time. You have lots of concerns. We all do. Um, but, you know, there was a time I that uh, people, I think we have a tendency to look back and see some special time as being a great time. So to avoid that today, I want to talk about a time that happened uh, some time ago. And I'd like the next slide, the title of the sermon is Better Days, and then the next slide there is a time in the 70s. Okay, um, most of you were alive in the 70s, and a bunch of you weren't. And so there was a group of guys in the 70s that uh, they played a song. Do you guys recognize these moppy-haired guys? You can probably even tell from there, can't you? Okay, it's the Fab Four, it's the Beatles. You guys know the Beatles are, right? Okay. Well, it was the late 70s, and they came out with a song, uh, called uh, I can get by with a little help from my friends. iTunes has it if you'd like that. I mean, you can get that, download that song. So that was the, the main, uh, you know, one of the top hits right then in the 70s, the late 70s. And, and do you know what else was going on in the 70s? A worse recession than we've exp- just experienced. It was worse for those that were alive and saw it. What else was going on? Oh, yeah, the Vietnam War was just ending. Our country was upside down confused. We had a peace movement that opened Pandora's box in a hundred ways and haven't been able to shut it since. But it was the 60s. It was the 70s. Um, There was a shooting on a college campus called Kent State that was a very famous shooting. Um, I, I, I remember as a little boy, I was very young, watching, you know, Vietnam on the news every night. Anybody else remember that? Uh, it was just a real tumultuous time. And it, and it had anything but peace was going on. Everybody was saying peace, but there wasn't much peace. I'm telling you, it was a wreck. Our culture was confused at the very best. And so, I think when we think about, you know, what, I, I'd like these to be the best days. Maybe they are. Maybe God can take the days that are here now, and that's what I want to talk about this morning, and do something with them. So, um, I went back to a prophet, and we're going to go, um, I, I, um, I have a goal for us, let me just say this, I have a goal for us this month. My goal is to turn you guys into a choir. Believe it or not, I, I was a choir director for a little while at church, okay? I know that's a shock to you guys and certainly a shock to my wife. And it's a shock to my father-in-law who's been a professional choir director for 50 years. Uh, but 
I, I want you guys, by the end of this month, by the time we hit Christmas Eve and we're all looking in the dark at each other and we've got those candles and we're singing Silent Night, for you guys to really be singing. I want you to be singing so loud that I can hear how off-key you are. That's, that's when you're really praising, when everybody goes, whoa. But at the same time, it kind of has this wonderful feel. And I'm telling you, if we become God's choir, he'll do something special. You just trust him for that. So my goal for us this month, and I'm just laying a little groundwork today, is to turn you guys into the Lord's choir, Christmas choir. Okay? And so we'll address that over the next few weeks. We start, started talking about better days. Um, and... and <laughs> Don't you ever get in a situation and you go, oh man, I'm not really made to be doing this. I'm better than this. Or you've looked at one of your friends and say, oh, come on, man, you're better than that. Come on, lady, you're, you're better than that. I'm so thankful that my parents looked at me when I was being a really knuckleheaded teenager and said, I can still remember my mother saying, Tim, you're better than that. And, and I was being pretty low down at the moment. So thank goodness that somewhere in us we know things ought to be better. So I want to rewind way back to a guy named Micah. Micah is in the mid-700s B.C. He is in a cluster of prophets, Isaiah, Micah, a cluster of prophets that is dealing with Israel in its worst, upside-down, messed-up time. It is the time of the exile, and everything is messed up. And so Micah is speaking into this time. He's speaking into Israel, and he, he has seen uh, a lot of corruption. If you read the whole book of Micah, he talks a lot about political corruption, corruption in high places. Then he also talks a lot about violence, all the violence he sees the thugs that are everywhere. It's his language, but it's the same sort of stuff. And, and we sort of, we really have that kind of culture as well. Um, some of you this morning are, are quite sure there's plenty of corruption in high places. And, and many of you know that it is, we have actually a sort of very violent culture in many ways. And so uh, Micah looked at that and, 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 and spoke right into it and said, and began to say, there's got to be a better day. Israel is not meant for this. God's people are not meant for this wreckage that they're in. And so he begins to roll it out there. And I have three points today that I want to roll out for you. And uh, if you have your weekender, uh, the big weekender there, there's a box for a sermon. You could write these points in. And I think you can keep up with me on this. It's just three words. The first word is past. The second word is future. And the third is present. Past, future, and present. Micah comments there in verse 2. At the end of verse 2, he said, You know, there's a ruler coming who is from ancient of days. Now, if he's speaking in about 722 to 745 B.C., who's he talking about? Who's from old that is going to come forward to this time to do something for us? Who is it? Who's he referring to? Now, if this is written 750 years approximately before Jesus walked this planet, what's he referring to? So um, he's talking about this in the past and, and, and what to, that someone is coming from the past. His origins are from old, from ancient times. I like that. We're going to ask uh, you guys not only to get your singing voices going, but also we're going to ask as many as we can of you to, uh, go, to go to the movies with us on December 13th. Um, and you say, well, that's not, is that really a church thing? I said, yeah, we can do anything we want. Do you know what the most popular 
yeah, you know, there's a lot of freedom in Christ. Don't get your squared up to square on that. But did you know, what's the most popular thing that Americans do? Spend the most money on? Movies. And that we would take our keisters over to a movie theater at the Edwards and sneak peek out the Hobbit and go together is a very, not only is it cool, it's, it's a good thing. I said, well, isn't that a weird movie? Yes, it is a weird movie. It's totally weird. And, and you say, well, isn't that kind of like you have to, you know, think really hard and stuff? No, you don't. Let me tell you a quick little story. I taught high school in East Los Angeles area for about three years after college. It was, there was a crazy bunch of students. And, and it was really rough. We had lots of Crips and Bloods. If you remember the 80s, that was the, the gangs in L.A. And so that was what our campus was made up of, primarily. And so I decided to try something with these young men and women and because, uh, you know, I could. And it was desperate times. They told me not to talk about the Lord. I talked to them every day. They say, you get fired. I don't care. I just poured it on the whole time I was there. And so I, I grabbed this book, and I actually hadn't read it myself because I thought, that's weird, you know, and The Hobbit. So I grabbed the book, The Hobbit, and I got a paperback from some cheap uh, place, you know, just a little paperback. And I began to read it on Fridays if everybody was cool. That's if nobody shot anybody, nobody stabbed anybody, they didn't attack me. Then we, we did. You think I'm kidding. But, uh, and so I read on Fridays in my class. And, and after a while, once the story began to get reeled out, it was kind of amazing. Those kids understood it. I still re remember a tall Mexican-American boy named Joel. Joel had a policeman shoot him point blank in the stomach and had staples across his stomach from that shooting. Joel would come up to me on campus and say, Mr. Maddox, are you going to read on Friday? I'd say, yeah, man, I'm going to read it. You be there. I'll read it. And do you know somehow in that little crazy story that he picked up on that there's another world besides the one he's running in and he has a chance at some other kind of life and that somehow it's connected. When J.R.R. Tolkien wrote this thing as a Christian, he said, I love all the myths and all the crazy stories with all half people and half animals. I love all those stories. I'm going to take them. I'm going to bunch them all up. I'm going to create a world, and I'm going to tell them that there's another world that you're not aware of. And it's the Christian world. That's, it was exactly what Tolkien said to C.S. Lewis as they walked around Oxford in the 1920s. The intent. And so, mostly gang kids who education might have peaked at sixth grade, they got the story. They said, oh, hmm, what does this mean? And it woke them up. And it's a, it's a story about a place that becomes cursed. There's a spell. People are under spell. And, and, and there's witches and people that are doing bad things to people. And, and they can't see their way out of it. And then there's a, a rescuer who must rescue. And he's called a king. The king is coming. What's the last book in the series? Return of the king. Oh, yeah. Return of the king. He's coming. And, and there's going to be some kind of crazy sacrifice that's going to have to happen in order to rescue. And it's going to be so last minute, you'll think it'll never happen. It'll scare you to death. It'll push you right up to the edge. You think Tolkien was telling a story? Yeah, he was. He was telling the story of Jesus. He was. He did it so well, you didn't even know it till it was over. Stories like that can go a long way. Christians get a little nervous around fairy tales and stuff because they think there's something sinister, but not those stories. Oh, no. 
There are some eternal truths being put out there. There are some... Uh, do we as Christians, let me just ask you this, did Jesus believe that there was a world beyond this world that you and I see? Didn't Jesus, like, name demons and stuff? And I mean, I know we're like, oh, Satan. Uh, well, Jesus just acted like, you know, there was a demon in that fella, and that, you know, Satan was at work, and they needed to go into the pigs and all these different incidences that are very strange to us. No one else does that. Apostle Paul doesn't do it. No one else does that. Jesus does that. Some say the spiritual confrontation peaked with Jesus, which would make sense, some of that stuff. But there's someone coming from the past, someone coming. And so these stories just represent a real story that really is true. They're not made up myths. Jesus is a historical person who came, born into history, an ancient king. So he comes from the past. And then he's also the future. What do Christians say about the future? What is it? Heaven. Would you guys like to hear some messages on heaven? Heaven, yeah. It's, it's promised. It's, it's all over the New Testament, this resurrection world that is better and complete and whole and full of shalom and all the stuff that we can't seem to find right now or we find in little bits and pieces especially as Christians sometimes we find that peace that we've been looking for that's what Micah says the prince of peace Isaiah is all over that stuff Isaiah 9 11 the prince of peace prince of peace in a very conflictual world so there is a future uh, when all political powers are come under control of God. There's a time when there's no tears. Some of you have great tears. Some of you, Christmas is actually not that great a time. And you know some people like that. If you've lost someone you love, if you've got some sorrow in your life, it seems to crawl up in us about Christmas time. You know, when Jesus was being born, what was going on? Oh, yeah, Herod was killing babies. It says, it says Rachel was weeping. That's a colorful way. The Bible uses colorful language. It's a colorful way. It says all the other women from that tribe of Rachel were all in tears over all the death. And then there was one baby that made it. How many times? So Christmas has conflict and things in it. And so the future promise of, of what God has for us, and as we focus on the future, as we focus on hope, the candle of hope, the future is about hope. We live different now if we focus on what God has for us in the future. If you knew you were in a fight, and you knew you already watched the... You guys watch fights? Boxing? I'm going to wait for Pacquiao and Marquez coming back. Okay, I like Manny. <laughs> and, uh, you know, a fight or UFC, something like UFC, you know, or, or, or whatever. But, you know, if, if you know, if, if the fight's pre-recorded and you already know the end, it's kind of hard to watch, isn't it? You notice that? You're like, ah, you know, <laughs> it's not as fun. But for Christians... We gotta have the end round. You guys know that, right? Have you read the end of the story? I mean, Jesus wins, wraps it all up, every knee, every tongue, every one, every plant, every animal, every star, every galaxy, every universe bows. Bows. So we know the end, but from now till then we gotta fight. And sometimes we get knocked down. And we got to know, in the end, that we win because of Christ. And we can live different because of that. We can take our hits. There is a past. There's a future. And then also the present. How does God work in the present with that? If people are created by God, they are created for God. 
If people are created by God, they are for him. So anybody that is not worshiping God is not fulfilling their purpose. So really what we're doing Christmas is we're trying to gather more worshipers. People who say, yes, you are to be worshiped, God of all things. And you have loved us so much. We were such rebels. We were so far from you. And we know there's a battle. There's a battle for you and I, for, for others. But God created us to sing, to dance. So my goal is for you guys to be singing and dancing by the end of this month. And those of you that refuse to dance in church, then your foot will tap. Okay, that, if we get your foot tapping. And um, anyway, so that's our goal. The, the, the scripture said that the trees will sing. It, you know, Tolkien, when he's writing these books, occasionally he'll grab biblical imagery and he'll just throw it in. You, you remember the trees and the stories? They're, they're alive and stuff bothers them and it's not right and justice has to come. And you don't want a big tree after you if you've seen the thing. But uh, trees sing. And you say, well, that's kind of, you know, that's fairy tale t- stuff, Pastor Tim. You know, is it, do you remember when Jesus was going into Jerusalem? What did he say? Oh, the rocks are going to sing if you don't. You better sing. Or this whole place, the ground itself is going to sing. Because the cosmos, the world, everybody knows. You need to know too. The trees will clap their hands. I like that. And busy clowning. Crowning him. Crowning Jesus. And that's what we're doing this month. So, how do we do this? I want to say, give you a, a, a few things to do this month that will help you um, find the Christmas spirit in a deep way in your life. A few apps to download to whatever you need. Okay? App number one. Believe in the birth and death of Jesus. Believe in the birth and death. Remember this. Did you hear Micah when he said... Uh, the king, Israel's ruler, will be struck on the cheek with a rod. What king got struck on the cheek? You know any? Yeah, Jesus. Slapped. Beaten. Yeah. Believe in the birth and death. Believe that he is the good shepherd who lays down his life for his people. He is the good shepherd. Believe in the cross of Christ. Don't take it out. And, and, and let me say this too. We, we encourage people to believe in, in Jesus. We're going to invite people over these holiday seasons to believe in Christ. And, and let me say this. People, uh, we don't present that if you don't believe, God is going to get you. Although the scriptures teach that God is all-powerful and he can get you. He just don't. We are presenting the good shepherd who lays down his life for many so people will understand if God did that for me, I must be able to trust him. That's the presentation that we present. That's why Jesus' humility and position is so different than normal kings. Why wouldn't I trust somebody? So the first thing is to believe in his death and his resurrection, birth, death, resurrection. And also, from uh, I want to read to you from Micah chapter 6, because Micah really... Uh, hammers everybody, uh, prophets have a habit of doing that, and then he comes back around, he said, and the people are saying, well, what do we do if life is like this? And in Micah 6, verse 6, I want, I want you to see this, because this, uh, this prophet from the 700th century has something to say, he says, verse 6, with what shall I come before the Lord and bow before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? Remember, they offered animals like you swipe your ATM card. That's about how fast the animals were being thrown up there and, and sacrificed. With calves a year old, precious young calves. 
Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and ten thousand rivers of oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Oh, man, that guy is in pain. And here's what Micah says. He has showed you, oh, man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly and to love mercy and to humbly walk with your God. The heart of that thing is humility before God. And humility before God. And we demonstrate that by obeying God. <laughs> Let me say, say this. You know, one of the reasons we come to church, right? I mean, I, we sing, we worship, we do But I every week, there's a transaction that has to happen. I'm not talking about the offering. There's a transaction that has to happen. You know what the transaction is? You have to allow God to be king of you again. You have to get out of God's chair and let him back in his chair. At the heart of all religious uh, services from, from Israel all the way forward and all the way forward to now, at the heart, every time, there is the opportunity, the moment, the prick of my heart, the stab, the wound, where I must allow God to be king. And you know he's my king if I obey him, don't you? Um, I really... <laughs> I really liked uh, the little sideways thing that Mitt Romney said in one of those de debates. He said, you know, my kids are standing there telling me the same thing over and over again, and I know it's not true. I, I still don't believe them, even no matter how many times they tell them. So for me to say that I, God is my king, but to disobey, is, it's just not true. He's not my king. So just know at the heart of you and me is that issue, to obey God. So believe in the birth, the death, and the resurrection of Christ. Obey him, humbly obey him. Another thing to do, Christmas, you want to make your Christmas really great, is stop worrying. Cut it out. You guys know I come from a family of worriers. I had a grandmother would sip on a beer and smoke cigarettes one after another worrying about us. Did it change us? No. It didn't help. And, and so worry, let go of stuff. I, I, I love what Luther said to his, his partner, Martin Luther, founder of of much of the Reformation, said to his partner, Philip Melanchthon, he was a theologian, he said, Philip worried a lot. He was a concerned guy. And, and Luther was a little more gregarious, drank a little more, you know, he's a little more out there. And Luther just said, Philip, stop, stop trying to run the world. It's not your job. Let it go. Let it go. Don't rule the world. And then the last thing, believe, humbly obey him, stop worrying, and then expect God to show up. Without faith, it is impossible to believe God. He that comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Let Christmas happen for you. Let it happen. It will. And sing hard this month, please. I'm going to turn you guys into a choir. It's going to happen. Man, I, I still remember having a choir and going into the Christmas time and going into Albertsons and singing to everybody in Albertsons. It was cool having a choir, you know, okay. Are you guys okay with that? Does that sound like a good plan for the month of December? Okay, let's offer it up to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for this day. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for Christmas.